Welcome to this program brought to you by the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum and by the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. I'm Michael Vendenand. I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council. And on behalf of my colleagues, Erica Kubik and Rachel Brooks and the Board of Directors of the Council, we express our gratitude for your interest in global engagement. Council's mission is to empower the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. And you can learn more about what we do at worldmichigan.org. We also thank our program partners, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. This program featuring Russian journalist Mikhail Zygar, author of the new book, War and Punishment, Putin, Zelensky, and the Path to Russia's Invasion of Ukraine. We will be led by our friend and global educator, Joel Westfall, the Deputy Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. Joel, we're grateful to you for your coordination of this program, and I turn to you to introduce our special guest and get things started. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and I've been looking forward to this for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, first of all, let me begin uh, by first a little uh, housekeeping. Um, uh, after um, uh, the questions that I'll be asking, Mikhail, uh, there will be a Q&A uh, session uh, afterwards. Uh, if you have any questions for Mikhail, uh, please use what is called the Q&A feature, uh, and you can submit your questions at any time uh, during the beginning phase of the, uh, of the lecture. Uh, and now uh, let me introduce our esteemed lecturer today. Mikhail Zygar has accomplished quite a bit in his role as an international journalist. He has worked for Newsweek Russia and Business, Day, uh, Business Daily Commerçant, covering the conflicts in places such as Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq, Serbia, and Kosovo, before becoming founding and editor-in-chief of Russia's only independent TV channel, Zdozd, uh, which provided an alternative to Kremlin-controlled federal TV channels and gave a platform to opposition voices. He would win the International Press Freedom Award in 2014 by Time Magazine. His first book publication, All the Kremlin's Men, became an instant number one hit, uh, number one bestseller in Russia, as well as others, uh, other places, and has been translated into over 20 languages and was called one of the nine books that can help you understand Russia right now. His previous book, The Empire Must Die, looks at the Russian Empire in its final days from 1900 to 1918 and provides an extraordinarily interesting journalistic account of the events rather than a more traditional historical one. Today, Mikhail is a weekly contributor to Der Spiegel and has most recently joined uh, the City University of New York, SUNY, as a Press Freedom Fellow. Please help me welcome to the digital stage Mikhail Zygar to talk about his latest book, War and Punishment. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for that introduction. That's my honor and pleasure to be part of that uh, program, to, of that conversation. I'm looking forward to all of your questions. Thank you. And we'll start off right away with the first one. Uh, first of all, uh, Mikhail, I found your I found your introduction very, very heartwarming. Uh, can you relate what was your impetus for writing this book and why it is so important for Ukrainians to not see all Russians as the enemy? You know, obviously, I I decided you know, to read to write this book uh, right after the beginning of uh, full scale invasion of Ukraine. Although I've started uh, thinking of it and I've, I've started collecting materials for this book uh, um, earlier. Uh, back in uh, 2021, and that was the year when I traveled across the Ukraine, and, I, and uh, that, that that was uh, the year when I first interviewed President Zelensky. But obviously, I I uh, reconsidered and I changed my approach after February 24th uh, because I realized that um, I feel that I I'm responsible for this war and I'm guilty for this war. I, I feel my my personal res responsibility as Russian author, as Russian um, uh, writer and journalist, and as as representative of Russian culture. And I do think that we we were 
we have been blind for so many years, if not to say centuries. We we have overlooked uh, all the dangers of uh, the imp Russian imperial ideology. We turned blind eye uh, to the pains of other peoples and other nations. Uh, we have argued against Ukrainians or Belarusians or other uh, peoples occupied by, by Russian empire. Um, and we're, we're not really careful about their uh, version of history and th their narrative. And we, we did not pay attention that, that our uh, traditional historical narrative, the classical version of Russian history uh, has always been an imperial propaganda. Unfortunately, most of classical Russian historians uh, have been um, working as propagandists and they were working for the Russian state, uh, for the Russian state. And unfortunately, uh, in most university of the, uh, universities of this world, you, you would not find uh, any history of Russian people or to be more correct of Russian peoples, because uh, yes, we, we have overlooked the fact that Russia is a colonial empire and has always been a colonial empire. And um, I think it's it's right time to start th this conversation. It's it's really needed. It's really needed to acknowledge that fact that uh, the brutal war between uh, Russian empire and uh, other peoples um, have started not in, in February 24th of last year uh, and not in uh, 2014, when the occupation of Crimea started. It, it started many centuries ago and we need to change our attitude just for the sake of um, um, future, future of, uh, of the Russian people, of other peoples. So, and um, I do not consider this book to be a book about Ukraine because I'm not a Ukrainian author. I'm not uh, entitled to uh, to write the history of Ukraine. I'm entitled to write the, the, the new version of history of Russia. And I sometimes compare this book to the um, you know, detective story written through the eyes of the murderer. Yeah, we, we have to, uh, um, to watch that. We, we have to, to understand the, the terrible history of, uh, of that empire. Great, that's great. Um, so your book uh, uh, starts uh, looks back uh, at Ukrainian uh, Russian history uh, for the purposes of arguing that there actually is indeed a, a Ukraine, a country of Ukraine, along with its own language and culture, uh, as well as Russia's consistent attempts throughout the centuries to rebuff and or put down this belief. Can you briefly uh, surmise uh, the historiographical review, uh, the viewpoint on this that you talk about in your book? Yeah, uh, sure. My idea is that Actually, we know quite a little about what what was really happening, but uh, our um, our approach consists of uh, uh, historical myths, and uh, I have seven most important historical myths uh, about uh, Ukrainian history or about history of Russian oppression of Ukraine, and all those myths are still alive. Uh, lots of Russians believe in all those myths, including President Putin. And he is always using uh, those myths, um, trying to justify his his brutal aggression. Uh, the first of, the first of, of them is so-called reunification of Russia and Russia and and Ukraine that happened in 17th century. So that's that's uh, uh, when our when that history began. Actually, R Russia, um, uh, Ukraine was. Um, probably it's fair to say occupied by by Russians back in 17th century only uh initially that was a contract signed by uh Ukrainian Cossacks and Russian Tsar but uh both sides understood the, that contract very differently because Russian Tsar uh, uh, has never signed any contracts with with other peoples or with other uh, other organizations uh unlike Ukrainian Cossacks which were um um, which were very active. Uh, probably they, they if if they were uh, live, living now, we we might have called them private army, and they uh, offered their service to different uh, governments, uh, including, for example, they 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 thought uh, they fought uh, um, during the the. Um, uh, Twenty uh, no. Uh, Thirty Years' War um, 
uh, in, in alliance with, with with France and Car Cardinal Mazarin. Uh, so they they frequently sign contracts with other governments. That's why they 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 signed an alliance with Russian Tsar. But he considered that uh, that was some kind of pledge of loyalty, and that was the the beginning of the troubled relationships between between uh, Moscow Crown and and Cossacks. Another important myth is a uh, myth of Ukra so called Ukrainian betrayal. Uh, the uh, history of Russian Emperor Peter the First and Ukrainian Hetman Ivan Mazepa, um, who decided to to break an alliance with with the Russian Emperor and uh, who decided to to switch sides and to uh, to make a, a new alliance with with Swedish Emperor because uh, he felt that uh, the policy of Russian Tsar was uh, anti Ukrainian. And and the, that historical event is widely known as the betrayal of Hetman Mazepa, and even described in, in a very famous Russian uh, poem by the greatest Russian poem, Alexander Pushkin. Uh, Poltava is one of the famous poems that uh, that is included in every uh, Russian literature textbook in Russia, although it's a totally propagandist and anti-Ukrainian uh, poem. Um, after that, very important uh, myth of uh, Catherine the Great, who um, conquered Crimea and uh, what is called Novorossiya, but also um, destroyed all the freedoms of Cossacks and um, brought serfdom to Ukraine. Or another uh, very important myth about Ukrainian language, and uh, uh, now a lot of Russian propagandists, uh, and even Putin, uh, say that Russian la uh, Ukrainian language does not not exist. It's the same the same uh, language as as the Russian one, as the Russian one, and that myth dates back to um, at least 19th century when when Russian Empire um, prevented any Ukrainian from uh, um, reaching any prominent level in um in the government or just ukrainians could uh could promote could be could have been promoted they 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 could come to st petersburg and um uh, and there was a possibility for, for them to become ministers generals um high aristocrats but with one little uh precondition they they should have abandoned their uh, national identity. They they should have stopped uh, speaking Ukrainian and and speak only Russian. And probably you, uh, uh, many of you have heard about Nikolai Gogol, the great Russian writer, uh, who is the very interesting, uh, thrilling example of of that uh, national tragedy. Because uh, Nikolai Gogol was Ukrainian, his mother tongue was Ukrainian, but he. Uh, when, when coming to St. Petersburg, he realized that he could not uh, reach any kind of popularity uh, if he if he was writing in Ukrainian. So, so that's why he deliberately started uh, writing all of his uh, uh, novels and tales in in Russian. And so we we have several more myths about uh, Lenin and his role in in creating. Uh, Ukrainian statehood about uh, definitely about Holodomor, uh, genocide of Ukrainian people or organized and pre-orchestrated by by Stalin. Um, uh, Russian propagandists today usually say that that nothing specific uh, happened with Ukrainians. Yes, uh, um, all all peoples uh, uh, peoples in Russia or in Kazakhstan or in, in Ukraine really suffered a lot during Stalin. But that's um, that's only uh, the surface. If if we if we would look uh, carefully uh, at at uh, Stalin's letters he was sending from. Uh, from his summer residence in Sochi to Moscow, how he, he was ordering purges among Ukrainian intelligent, uh, intelligentsia, among uh, the leaders of the uh, Ukrainian Republic, um, we, we would clearly see that that, that was a, a punishment for Ukrainian people because they were um, re revolting a lot against Stalin's policy, against the Stalin's uh, collectivization. And... Um, Album uh, simultaneously to, together with the Great Famine, with that great tragedy of Ukrainian people, there was uh, another another tragedy, so-called uh, executed renaissance of, of Ukrainian culture. 
uh, all the greatest poets and writers uh, um, who were writing in, in Ukrainian were uh, arrested, imprisoned, and then executed um, at, the, at the same time. And just to finish my, my list, the last uh, and very popular uh, uh, among uh, Russian propagandists myth is about Stepan Bandera and uh, yeah, uh, but yeah. You mentioned it, you talk about him a lot in the book. Yes, and Ukrainian yeah. uh, and collaboration with, yeah. between Ukrainians and Nazis. Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, I don't think uh, many Americans, you mentioned this, of course, you mentioned this in, the, in your book, but I don't think many Americans know that during the Great Depression, uh, many of our, our own corporations here went to the Soviet Union to help build factories for Stalin. My question to you is, was this a uh, history common knowledge in the Soviet Union, Russia, and is it your view that global U.S. corporations today should take a stance at what is currently going on in Russia and Ukraine? Mm, you know, that's a great idea, actually. Uh, I've, I have never thought of that. No, actually, that's not a common knowledge. Uh, uh, Stalin was not boasting with the fact that that he was buying technologies uh, uh, from from the United States. He uh, he preferred the myth that that uh, that uh, he has made it. On his own, and that that Russia did not rely on anyone's help. So uh, most Russian history textbooks do not um, mention that that fact. But um, you know, I think it's it's really important um, to uh, to, un to understand that if if we're speaking about what's happening right now, uh, to help Ukraine is really important because it's not the matter of uh, of the future of this particular nation. It's uh, it's it's very important for for the security and democracy in Europe, and it's uh, equally uh, um, necessary for the uh, future of Russia. But it's also uh, very important uh, because the values uh, should matter. Ukraine is is probably the only uh, the first example for the many many decades uh, when we we had a very clear. Uh, aggression of one state uh, against another and um, show, showing support to Ukraine means uh, uh, that we we should show that we still believe in values and the fact that that European governments, European people, American government, uh, people in America and, com and probably companies uh, in, in America uh, support uh, Ukraine, that's very important because it's not about real politics, it's about the values. Thank you, thank you, Mikhail. Um, next question, uh, and this one is, uh, I'll be honest, uh, I was reading your book, um, I have to admit, I was really shocked uh, at one particular point, um, since I, mean, I don't know how many other authors or journalists I've yet to see really any, um, I've openly written about this. Uh, and what I'm referring to are your comments about the Moscow apartment bombings. Uh, historically, is it historically, is it your contention that the bombings were part of an FSB Maskirovka operation to gain popular support during the opening phase of the Second Chechen War? You know, that's a very sophisticated question because um, most Russian independent journalists suspected that from the beginning. And, you know, during all those years, we all had the same conversations. We we were uh, telling each other, yeah, it's very suspicious, but it could not be, it could not be true. Uh, yes, we we don't trust FSB, but they, they we just, it could not, they could they cannot be that bad they could they they are probably murderous but not that bloodthirsty murderous uh and that that was the main uh the main direction of our conversations during all those years probably till uh till 2020 till the moment when uh the leader of russian opposition alexei navalny was uh infamously poisoned, poisoned but happily uh uh, could survive um, thanks to German doctors, uh, and then um, with help of other journalists, with help of uh, Bellingcat and Christian Grozev, uh, he managed to investigate his own um, murder attempt. Uh, and now we know quite a lot. We know we know that 
obviously FSB is killing people. We know that there is a huge department uh, in Russian secret services uh, in charge of murdering political opponents. Uh, that's that that was such a uh, eye-opening re revelation that changed a lot for for most of Russian journalists. Then we had the beginning of uh, the brutal aggression, full-scale aggression about Ukraine, and that that changed our attitude to Russian regime to to put in the regime even further. We we could have never expected that such brutality was was possible. So. I guess that if if we if we had doubts because we we could not believe that that such uh, such brutality was possible. Now we don't have all those doubts. And I I, I would add uh, one more one more detail. I I also mentioned that in in my book. You probably remember it. Uh, I was really I was really shocked during the the first month of of the war. When I've learned of uh, uh, coincidental uh, of three coincidental deaths of three uh, prominent uh, Soviet post-Soviet politicians, three personalities who made the greatest contribution for the collapse of Soviet Union, three people who made uh, yes. Belovezhia Act Accords that, yeah. died during one week. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 former first president of Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk, then former um, head of um, uh, Belarusian parliament, uh, Svetoslav Shushkevich, and then the author of those accords, former secretary of state of Russia, Gennady Burbulis, they all died almost um, um, simultaneously during the first month of the war. And that was very tragic and very weird coincidence. But I will tell you more. I knew Gennady Burbulis uh, very well because during the last five years, I've been writing a book about the collapse of Soviet Union and I've been interviewing him frequently. I, I met him at least two times a week. I knew that man very well. And he was in a great shape. He, he was in his 70s, but he's... His physical shape was great. He was running mar marathons. Uh, so I do not believe that uh, just, so everything can, can happen with elderly people, but uh, I do not believe in such a coincidence when, when three most fierce enemies of Soviet Union uh, die simultaneously during the war that in, uh, in point of view of, of Vladimir Putin and FSB is a war that should symbolically restore Soviet Union. That's uh, uh, another question. Um, and I think many, a lot of Americans might not be familiar with this, but um, so in your book, you talk at great length. Um, in fact, it's my favorite part of the book on how you kind of talk about Zelensky's transformation from comedy to acting to the presidency. Uh, for those in the United States, can you briefly explain the Kavayan system, which I think has absolutely no analogy in the United States? And my wife has, my wife Tatiana described it to me as kind of a sarcasm on steroids, uh, comedy team style routines, which and which team is the most sarcastic wins? Yeah, it's really it's it was really hard for me to try to explain that in the book, but I found it really important because I needed to show the evolution as, as of, of Vladimir Zelensky as a person, and at the same time, the evolution of the humor, uh, what kind of humor was acceptable uh, 20 years ago, uh, and and what about now? Uh, I would say that, that KVN, that's the name of the show, is some kind of a mixture of um, American uh, college basketball league uh, Saturday Night Live and The Voice. So <laughs> imagine, imagine that there is a league, and every uh, university in your country has a team, but they do not play basketball. They they write sketches for Saturday Night Live, and once a month they mm, come to uh, come uh, come to the stage. And that's that's a TV show, and they show their sketches one after another, and there is some some kind of uh, jury, like in The Voice, 
and those people are judging them uh, and the team that is more fan, more funny, more sarcastic, more uh, entertaining uh, uh, wins and goes to another round. And that's like a huge league of um, um, several dozens of, of teams from all across the country, not only uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the beginning of 90s, it was not... Uh, um, it was Russian uh, TV show, but uh, the, the, the teams that participated were from Ukraine, from Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, uh, Belarus, um, all other, all the countries of former Soviet Union. So, and yes, uh, Vladimir Zelensky was uh, was a star of, of that TV show. Um, his uh, he, his team was a champion, and um, that was it. It was it was he. He even played for two teams, uh, and it's very it's very interesting that um, it, for, for example, it was his own personal choice to stop playing, uh, uh, to stop being a Russian superstar, um, and to return from Moscow to Kiev. He 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 used to live in Moscow till two thousand and three, two thousand four, uh, till the moment several years while he was playing in that TV show, and he was very well known in, in every Russian household. But then it was his his moral choice. It was not because of uh, some poli any political issues. He didn't care. He didn't care about politics that time. He just wanted to come back to Kiev and and to um, to work for for his people for for Ukrainian television. And that that was uh, the choice, and it's very symbolic that uh, his decisions um, have some right with the, the political development of Ukraine. So he came uh, approximately the same time as Orange Revolution happened in Ukraine. And that's so I think his uh, his life is, is a very symbolic. He is a very um, typical representative of his generation. Um, and it's very important to, to mention that um, he is the representative of the first post-Soviet generations of Ukrainian politicians. Because uh, if we have a look at Ukrainian presidents, the two first presidents were Soviet generation. They they used to be members of uh, Communist Party. Even more, they were high-ranking members of Communist Party. Then there were several uh, presidents uh, who used to be members of Komsomol, um, Youth uh, Communist League, uh, and they were also prominent members of uh, of that communist organization. And Zelensky is the first the first person uh, who didn't spend most of his life in Soviet Union, who was uh, young enough to be a member of Komsomol. So most of his life uh, um, was after the collapse of Soviet Union. So he he doesn't he doesn't share that. Uh, the colonial culture, culture yeah shift. yeah colonial background uh soviet background and that's very important because he's not the only one he's the representative of of uh, uh of his society yeah, i found i found you're talking about the kvn system and how he used that to kind of improve his his uh, uh notoriety uh the fact that he it made him famous it made him famous um it was a system that you could uh, you could become famous if you were on a member of a, one of the best teams in in Soviet Union, and he was on one of these teams. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and he he used that um, to to, be, to become a, a stand a stand up comedian and an actor uh, and a producer. And he he was uh, he produced uh, several very uh, successful comedies, and he has has become one of the uh, best known movie stars in in yep. all former Soviet Union. So um, let's move to uh, talk about Vladimir Putin. Uh, while there is uh, a, a lot in the book that speaks to the mindset of what led Putin down the path to war, uh, I was very taken in by your using Viktor Pinchuk's comments following the diplomatic turnabout, which led to the Orange Revolution. You quote him saying, at first, I didn't think that the pro-European discourse, i.e. the idea of Ukraine's promotion to the European Union, could have caused such bitterness in Moscow. Only later did I realize that modern Russia does not accept the very philosophy of win-win at all. 
the principle of who is not with us is against us is a strategy of the entire Putin world rule. Uh, for him, many pro-Western actions are synonymous with anti-Russian ones. Uh, the message is simple. You cannot decide anything without us. Russia does not need equal partners. It needs satellites and vassals. What is your view on this? Yeah, it's very interesting, but I would say that it's it's a bit more complicated because it's uh, uh, first it's deeply rooted into uh, into Russian and Soviet history, and yes, a lot of people of uh, all the generations, uh, people of Putin's generation, uh, do believe that there is no difference between between Russians and Ukrainians. They don't know the context. They don't know history. So it's they they are quite sincere about that. But uh, what has happened with Putin is um, is much worse because he is he has become very paranoid. And I'll I'll tell you a brief story uh, how that happened. Um, as a person, he he was uh, he was influenced by his um, by his experience of uh, working. Um, in KGB, as well as uh, an experience of being um, vice mayor of St. Petersburg in the 90s, uh, who was in charge of foreign trade, which means who was in charge of uh, working with mafia and helping mafia smuggling um, anything uh, to St. Petersburg. So, so actually, he, he was very close to, to the gangsters of St. Petersburg here in the 90s, that shaped his personality and that shaped his his psych psychology. He um, he's very suspicious person, uh, but at the same time, um, what the, the most important uh, uh, turn, turning point in his in his approach to Ukraine probably ha happened in two thousand four, right during the uh, the Orange Revolution that we mentioned. The, uh, there was a presidential campaign in Ukraine and the. Democratic candidate Viktor Yushchenko was opposed by pro-Kremlin uh, candidate Viktor Yanukovych, the candidate backed by President Putin. And Putin was so uh, active during that um, presidential campaign, he was campaigning himself. He, he was coming to Kiev, he was speaking to the, uh, to the media, he was uh, touring uh, uh, in Ukraine. So he acted as uh, that was his his own election, um, and then uh, he spent a lot of money on uh, Russian spin doctors who were sent to Ukraine to to help to run that campaign. And um, I remember perfectly well the moment that was uh, in the beginning of November uh, two thousand and four. That was the day when uh, the presidential ele election happened in the United States. Uh, George W. Bush against John Kerry, and there was a reception in the residence of American ambassador in Moscow, and I was there, um, and all Russian political scientists, all prominent Russian political scientists, including all of, like almost all of them, had to be in Kiev that day because they were working for for U Ukrainian uh, presidential ele election at, this, at that very time. But the, there was a little uh, holiday break for them between the first round and the runoff, uh, and one of them, one of very well-known Russian political scientists um, was uh, holding uh, uh, whiskey in his, uh, in his hand, and he was la laughing uh, and ironically saying, what, what can we say about American democracy? They've got, el the election day is today. And we still don't know who is going to be the winner. In our elections, he meant Ukrainian, the situation is much better. The runoff is only uh, in a week, but we already know that our candidate is going to win. That will be Viktor Yanukovych. They were 100% sure that their candidate is going to win. And that was uh, that. Uh, what they were reporting to Putin. Putin was 100% sure that, that his candidate was winning, but everything went wrong. Uh, Ukrainians uh, started protesting. There was a huge protest rally, never ending protest rally on the main square of Kiev, Maidan, 
Um, and as a result of that uh, public outrage against uh, electoral, electoral fraud, um, Democratic candidate Viktor Yushchenko was proclaimed a winner. And all those technologists, all those spin doctors could not report to Putin that they, they failed, that they were just incompetent. They uh, have stolen all the money allocated to that electoral campaign. They were they were completely ineffective and 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 were lying to him all the time. So they had to invent a theory. They they reported that they did everything right, but Americans did more, and Americans paid much more, and American spin doctors were more active, and they had more money, more resources. And actually, it was not about their incompetence. It was George W. Bush who was supporting pro-American candidate Yushchenko. And that was the reason why Putin and his team failed during that election. And that, that was the turning point. That was the beginning of Putin's paranoia. He really believed, he really started believing that, uh, uh, that Bush had that uh, theory. And even more, <laughs> In two months, when there was um, President Bush's in, uh, inauguration, uh, his speech was very um, ambitious. He was, uh, it was called Bush, uh, Bush's doctrine. He was speaking about uh, um, spreading democracy all over the world. He was promising to come to, to all those authoritarian regimes and to bring them democracy as uh, it has already been done uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Georgia, and Ukraine. Uh, and Putin took that uh, as a threat. Putin considered that as a direct threat to his uh, personal um, uh, power. He thought that the next tar that he's going to be the next target. So uh, that he was really afraid by that, and that was that was the reason why he never uh, treated Ukraine separately he treated ukraine everything what was happening in ukraine as as a um, danger to he to himself he considered uh, all the political process in ukraine as a rehearsal of the revolution in russia so great uh, uh transition just really quickly you do cover this quite a bit in your book I and mean, quite extensively you were there during the orange revolution in person on the maidan what was it like for you to experience that as as a journalist and as well as someone who was just in the crowd? Uh, you know, I had a uh, quite a long experience as um, as a war correspondent. I worked in lots of different places in Iraq, in um, in Sudan, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, I was I I had to cover a lot of different revolutions in uh, in, in different countries and a lot of. A lot of terrible things, a lot of massacres. Um, I had to investigate political murders. So being in Kiev in 2004 was probably one of the happiest assignments I, I had in my life because the victory of Orange Revolution was uh, was a total happiness. That was that meant that everything is not in vain, that actually values matter, that, that people matter, that uh, the corrupted officials um, can win, and they they can uh, um, threaten. They they can put pressure, but it's but their capacity is limited. So, and there is one one moment when enough is enough, and um, and democracy can win. And definitely, uh, all of us, uh, all of Russian citizens, all of Russian journalists, were thinking. Uh, uh, in the same way, we yes, we were thinking that we should be the next. That uh, we we started dreaming uh, of the some kind of the revolution uh, happening in Russia, and um, in in eight years when I was working as as editor in chief of uh, uh, Russia's only independent uh, news TV channel. Um, and the protest rally started in Russia, and we were the first TV channel to to start covering them. And we were, uh, and we helped all those uh, protest rallies to happen because the the uh, our audience watched that uh, the protest rallies were possible, 
and they were not suppressed by the police and they are and like they are so massive that the authorities just don't know how to suppress them uh, and what to do with them they have to tolerate them and then every next approach Australia was uh, was bigger and bigger uh, I had the same feeling all uh, during those months I had the same feeling I was 100% sure that we were prevailing I was sure that that Putin's um, dictatorship uh, was doomed and he 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 had to go um within months or at least years but actually i was naive to make that conclusion well you uh, also discuss uh many of the very popular soviet dissidents in your book solzhenitsyn brodsky sakharov vasil stus is there a comparison to the dissidents of the Soviet Union of the 60s, 70s, and 80s to today's dissidents uh, like Maria Alekhina, Kasparov, Navalny? What do they face in comparison to what those in the Soviet Union faced? You know, I think there is a very important, very important difference because uh, dissidents of the Soviet Union, they had no hope. They had no hope at all. They knew that their their ultimate goal was to sacrifice, so they they could not dream of uh, uh, struggling for power. They were not politicians. They were they knew that they had to die, and probably it would be an inspiration for someone. Uh, that's that might be a difference between uh, between all those heroic people and uh and the dissidents uh who were active in Russia during the last decade because still in Russia there was hope and Alexei Navalny was was a great example of that he was he has always uh he would uh start arguing if he uh if he um, had heard your question because definitely he doesn't consider himself to be a dissident. He considers himself to be a politician and he has always uh, tried to portray himself as, as one and as the person who wants to become the president of Russia and who wants, and who wants to change the country. And uh, till recently, it, it changed for, for a lot of people. The beginning of full-scale aggression uh, against Ukraine made uh, a lot of people forget about uh, our dreams. It was a turning point for, for, for many people. And a lot of people stopped believing that uh, a bright, decent, democratic future for Russia is possible. Um, and yes, I think that a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of current dissidents who, uh, who live abroad, who live in exile are as desperate as uh, the previous generation of Russian dissidents. Um, not all of them. I know that uh, even in Russia and even in exile, there, there are still um, naive or idealistic or very determined people who, who are still trying and who still believe that, uh, it's still a, that the political change is still possible. Um, and at the same time, I think that yes, um, we we are in a def in a different position uh, because Russian society uh, that time and Russian uh, society today are very different. Um, we have very important technology uh, technological advance. We've got internet. We've got a lot of information coming from Russia, and we have uh, possibility to. Um, to deliver our message. We know that that uh, YouTube is not blocked. We know that all the media in exile are working. We know that uh, the most important media working from the exile, I would say three most important media, uh, Dorscht, Medusa, and FBK, uh, the foundation of Alexei Navalny, they are needed, they are watched inside Russia, and they are extremely popular. So we, we are, in a more privileged position uh, than our predecessors. 
I have uh, a couple more questions left, and I promise we'll get to the uh, Q&A in a little bit. We might go a little longer than an hour today, but I think that's okay. I think we're all having a really good time. And so the I answers promise are to be, I promise absolutely to be fantastic. Very, very, very brief with my don't, don't worry. Don't worry I'm about sorry. it. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Uh, not at all. It, this has been uh, very illuminating, and I know the I know the audience has, uh, is, is, is extremely excited about hearing more of what you have to say. Um, I have one more question that I have written, and then one that I've actually received from a bunch of uh, a bunch of folks. Uh, so my last one is is the following: um, You write you write the following. Uh, in the Soviet Union, there are two faces. Uh, actually, this is a quote. You're quoting someone. In the Soviet Union, there are two faces: one official, one underground. There is the Communist Party, propaganda mass holidays celebrated by citizens who pretend to believe in communism and a brighter future, while in reality they chase after scarce items of food or imported clothes and dream of, and in quote here, li living like in the West. What do Russians dream of now? No, it's very, it's a very sad question because yes, Russia has become uh, 100% capitalist country. Russia has become probably one of the most capitalist countries in the world. And now Russians have all of the mentioned above. Um, the previous two decades were probably the most prosperous uh, decades in, in Russia ever. Um, so R Russians have it all. Russians, um, in Russia, the, <clears throat> there is the new bourgeoisie that exists now in Russia. And the fact that a lot of people have a lot to lose and they don't want to lose their apartments, their comfortable life, their cars, their jobs, their um, possibility to travel abroad, that makes them very passive. You know that uh, 100 years ago, even more, Lenin uh, used to say that um, the working class has nothing to lose except for their chains. Uh, and that's why the revolution was inevitable. Now, the any kind of uprising against Putin is inevitable because everything, because everyone has a lot to lose. People know what's what's at stake. They know that um, they, they have just tasted that flavor of uh, rich life, a lot of people. I'm not speaking about the, um, the elite in Moscow. I'm speaking about the middle class in Moscow and a lot of Russia's big cities. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are um, satisfied with their lives. And that, that makes them uh, very cautious. They that doesn't mean that they support uh, everything Putin does. They doesn't mean that they they support the war, uh, but they just value uh, their comfort, and that's the main the main difference be between uh, Russians today and uh, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, I'll tell you more. There is one very important uh, difference be between uh, Soviet economy and Russian economy right now. Uh, Soviet Union was suffocated without uh, Western technologies. Uh, Soviet Union didn't have computers, didn't have microchips. Uh, so Soviet technology was, could not be developed at all. It was very backwards. And unfortunately, the situation right now is quite different because uh, Russia is not isolated by the West, by, by, the whole the rest of the world it's isolated from the west but it has china uh to supply it with its microchips and technologies uh it has china and india uh to buy oil and gas and unfortunately even more um i guess that there, there was a huge mistake uh made by the west right in the beginning of uh, of the of this full-scale aggression when a lot of people a lot of uh uh, Russian businessmen, a lot of representatives of Russian middle class were so shocked, were so terrified by the beginning of this war, of this uh, aggression against Ukraine, they were so uh, 
emotional and really determined to leave the country to start fighting against this, this war, to start supporting Ukraine, to, to do anything they could because uh, they were shocked and they they were sure that uh, their future they were dreaming of is not possible anymore. They were sure that the, the whole uh, future was destroyed by Putin. Uh, but their intention to, to leave Russia, to go to work in the West, in Europe, or in any other places, was stopped because uh, European Western banks did not welcome uh, um, holders of Russian passports. Anyone uh, uh, who had Russian passport uh, found their um, accounts frozen or blocked. Uh, even I, um, who, who came as a political refugee from Russia uh, after the beginning of the full-scale aggression, and I opened my bank account in Germany in the beginning of March, and in two weeks it was it was shut down because of my Russian passport. Uh, okay, I'm a journalist. I I don't uh, I don't care about money. I don't have money. Uh, I didn't have any any business. I should I should take care of. Uh, I should take care of, of my family only. But if I was a businessman, and, and I know a lot of um, a lot of businessmen, I'm not speaking about all the so-called oligarchs affiliated with Putin. I'm speaking about middle-level business. They they found that they just they cannot do anything. They didn't have any other choice to uh, uh, um, any other choice but to come back to Russia because Russia was the only possibility where they could have any money where uh, they, they could have any business. They were afraid that Putin was about to start purges uh, against his political enemies. But all those purges didn't, didn't happen. He, start, he started um, repressions against those who spoke out against the war actively, but the rest of the business was welcome. Uh, and what we have, we have, uh, we have an investment boom in Russia from Russian oligarchs who had to uh, return their assets and their money from the West. We have the investment boom from, from Russian businessmen who used to uh, withdraw their incomes and uh, keep them in Western banks or who used to um, send their kids um, to study in Europe or who used to travel uh, in Europe or to America. Now they cannot have that possibility because they have to keep their money in Russia. They have to spend them in Russia. They have to invest in Russia. Uh, late last year, International Monetary Fund um, um, reported that, that, that Russian GDP was minus uh, 1 point, um, sorry, 2.1 last year. And the forecast for this year was uh, minus uh, 2.3. Then in January, it um, changed its estimate. And in January, uh, IMF uh, um, predicted that uh, the growth of Russian economy would, would be 0 0.3. Then in April, they changed it for 0 0.7. In June, they changed it for 1.5. In October, they changed it for uh, 2.1 or 2.3. So now we, we, we have growth. Yeah, we have growth in Russia, and that's um, that's a huge present to President Putin. Uh, no one was expecting last year because everyone was really sure that that Russian economy was going to collapse. I'm sorry for such a long answer. No, no, not 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 at all. <clears throat> so this last this this question here, I I have uh, been asked to uh, ask this from uh, quite a few other quite a few uh, uh, patrons and and uh, friends. Um, and that is, um, uh, I have to ask, uh, I have had many requests, uh, as the start of the war in Ukraine affected the state of the LGBTQ plus community in Russia today, is it the same or is it worse? Um, you know, I know quite a lot about the LGBT community, uh, because I'm a representative of it. And, um, uh, I married my longtime partner. Uh, last October, uh, when we left Russia, we, we 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 did it in Portugal because that was that was absolutely impossible while we 
we we lived in Russia as it's outlawed in Russia. It's not legal. Uh, and that was the moment when I had a possibility to, to check the real level of homophobia in Russia because we 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 made it public. We posted um, our um, the news about our wedding uh, in our social media, uh, and it was um, it was, uh, it has become a very important news on all Russian propagandist TV channels, all the the worst. Uh, propagandist TV shows um, uh, were discussing our marriage for a week at least. Uh, we were called Satanists by uh, by Dmitry Kisilov, the, the worst uh, Buddhist propagandist. Uh, we were cursed by Nikita Mikhalkov, the the infamous filmmaker, one one once Oscar winning filmmaker, but now he's he's completely crazy. Uh, and so we were expecting that we. We had to be um, to be coerced by the the population of Russia because actually actually it was some some kind of the first uh, public uh, same sex marriage of um, of public people of um, well known people. Uh, but what we had in reality was quite the contrary. We were expecting a wave of hatred, but uh, we received tens of thousands of personal messages on our social media, uh, on, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, um, and 99% were warmest wishes, uh, were people thanking us for, for being brave and for being an inspiration. Uh, people were, were, really, were really nice. They were really sincere. Uh, we received a lot of uh, messages from rep representatives of LGBTQ community, uh, as well as from um, from straight men and women. It was into, uh, and it was the moment when I realized that the the, percept, the stereotype of the homophobic Russia is uh, is exaggerated because we have very homophobic uh, political establishment. We have very homophobic Soviet generation of um, those, those people who surround Putin, and they're trying to play with it. They're trying to, um, to exaggerate this. Uh, they they were uh, so, some sometimes they, they are making that for not even for domestic consumption, for but for, for the international consumption. For example, this year. Unexpectedly, Russian Parliament has uh, Russian Parliament voted for the new law that outlawed uh, transgender people, and that was really surprising act because, you know, no one cares unfortunately in Russia in, in Russia about L, uh, about transgender people. Uh, that's not that's not something that is widely discussed. That's not in an everyday agenda. If it's in any kind of agenda, but it's here in America. Uh, America is the only place where, where I hear the, the, the slogan, uh, trans lives matter. So when Russian parliament voted for that uh, law, that was only a message sent to America. That was a message sent to American far right to show that, look, there are some um, traditional values uh, kept in this country. We are your potential allies. It's uh, it's a hypocrisy. It's Putin's political hypocrisy, but that's how he uh, that th that's how he plays. That that's that's the impression he wants to produce. Very interesting. Okay, now to the questions. Uh, I've got a call. Only have a couple of them. Um, uh, thank you for those who put it uh, put the questions in. Uh, the first one comes from Jennifer. Uh, she writes, I am currently living in Slovenia and have found some people who see the war as more of an American aggression or, or not even a war or that Russia is not the only party at fault. Uh, she's asking for any suggestions on talking points to counter them. Uh, these are my family and co-workers, so I need to be diplomatic. Great question. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's really... Mm... It's really complicated because uh, that's the turn of uh, Russian propaganda. Uh, in the beginning, uh, Putin claimed that uh, there are Nazis in Ukraine, and that's why Ukraine needs to be denazified. 
but that that's uh, th that message did not work apparently for the Russian audience, so they had to adjust it from the beginning. So they changed uh, the message, and the, uh, as uh, Russian army was was um, uh, defeated from the beginning of the war in March and April uh, ne uh, ne next to Kiev, they 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 changed the enemy. They uh, they stopped saying that they were fighting against Ukrainians. They started uh, saying that they are fighting against Americans. That's actually uh, the existential war between Russians and uh, and the West and NATO. And that's only a proxy war. And Ukrainians are used as um, as puppets by Americans. That's that's the narrative uh, RT. Um, Putin, uh, Russian pro propaganda are, are spreading. Um, it's really, it's really ridiculous. As actually ridiculous is the message that NATO is to blame. Uh, uh, that's another part of of that narrative. That uh, the the real reason for this war. So uh, the war can be justified, they say, because uh, because of NATO enlargement. Uh, NATO sh should have never been enlarged, and uh, in, in this way, Putin would be very calm and peaceful, and would have never started the war. Uh, you know, no one really cares about NATO. No one really suspected. Uh, Putin didn't suspect that NATO can invade Russia. That's that that's nonsense. Uh, even more, back in the year 2000, uh, when Putin was just elected a president, he had an idea that that Russia could join NATO. Uh, NATO. So it's he 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 never afraid uh, he was never afraid uh, of the real aggression against Russia. He was never afraid of um, Americans invading Russia. He the only thing he's afraid of of losing his power. So this war is actually. Uh, is a possibility for him uh, to stay in power forever. So he needs this war because that's the only mechanism that, that keeps him in power. Um, and unfortunately, that's why he doesn't need any negotiations. He doesn't need any truce or any ceasefire because he, he needs this war. Uh, Putin has a list of uh, foreign agents uh, that's who are considered to be uh, enemies of the state. Are you on this list? Absolutely, sure, yeah. A proud member, a proud <laughs> member uh, uh, of uh, this list. And I'll tell you more, um, you know, actually, um, when it was just, uh, when this law was was just uh, uh, introduced, uh, it's it looked a bit scary and very insulting. And the first uh, foreign agents were, really confused and didn't know what to do uh but during the last years that's that's like um, badge of honor we uh every when when i was uh, uh labeled as, as a foreign agent it was better than a birthday i was receiving congratulations uh from from everyone from people i know and don't know uh even more um uh, as my books are ironically are still being sold in uh, in Russia in in not not in all the bookstores but in some bookstores. Uh, when I was um, labeled as foreign agent, uh, the books uh, the bookstores had uh, to add stickers on each book, and it, uh, uh, usually it was written: "This is a very dangerous book. Uh, you should not buy it because it's written by the foreign agent." Uh, you may imagine that the sales skyrocketed and it was very profitable decision for me. Yeah. Um, next question comes from Lee. Uh, I think it's a good one. Uh, was Georgia and Armenia, were they a precursor to the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine? Were they kind of a practice? Um, excuse me. Uh, I'm not sure that. Uh, could you repeat it? Yeah, uh, he's asking, Ge was... Uh, uh, he, he's asking whether the Georgian, uh, whether Georgia and the Armenia, uh, th those those events were they precursor the, the precursors to the Ukrainian invasion. Were they practiced for the for the Ukrainian invasion? I'm assuming he's meaning Georgia uh, in, in the early 2000s, of course, prior to the 2014 and the Little Green Men. 
Um, there was the issue with Georgia. I'm not sure what he means yeah. by Armenia. Armenia is kind of going on now. I don't. I don't recall yeah. an, an earlier Armenia. Probably, operation. probably it could be. Yeah, it, could, it could be two two recent wars between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan in in Nagorno Karabakh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it's it's a bit more complicated. And as I do not remember, I uh, I, I do not believe that um, there is a predetermination. I do not believe that that Putin had the strategy uh, to do what he did from the beginning. I always say that that Putin is not a strategic player. Uh, he's not a chess player. I always compare uh, him uh, with a surfer. He's a, a brilliant tactical player. He's um, he's so effective because he's very quick in changing his decisions. He's not. Um, he doesn't have parliament um, to consult with. He doesn't have oppositional uh, uh, parties. He doesn't care about the public opinion. So he can make any decision very quick. Uh, and he prefers not to take any decision till the last moment. He usually thinks that the time is on his side uh, and, and he can wait. And unfortunately, that's, that's the moment. Uh, that's what is happening right now. He does believe that the time is on his side right now he he's not he doesn't feel that that he is humiliated uh uh in ukraine he feels that um he's not running running out of money and out of soldiers because he's he's paying a lot to the new soldiers to the people who live in the most uh poor and de depressive regions of russia so so he can wait for western support to ukraine to fade away, um, that and that's that's his tactics, not not strategy. I know that he started uh, preparing for this war, uh, for this exactly that kind of uh, full scale aggression uh, uh, in the beginning of uh, 2021. Um, I don't think that there there was a clear strategy before that. There were different scenarios. Uh, but I'm sure that um, he didn't take that decision till in a year be before the aggression. Uh, I might say that um, the recent war uh, that that happened uh, between um, the the recent military operation uh, that uh, was um, uh, organized by Azerbaijan in Nagorno Karabakh was a clear political consequence of, of Russian aggression against Ukraine because uh, really no one paid attention that the whole Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh had to flee from the, the territory they used to live for like all of their life. It was a huge humanitarian catastrophe and it was completely uh, unnoticed by anyone in this world. Uh, so in that way, it was connected, but I don't think that uh, uh, they, they, they were discussing it, they were conspiring it, against it. Well, I'd like to thank uh, all the, some of the questions I can, unfortunately, I can't get to really, uh, really anymore. I just wanted to ask one last one. Mikhail, what's next for you? What, what's the next book? Um, no, I have uh, I have two projects I'm working on simultaneously. I've mentioned that that uh, I've started writing um, a book about the collapse of Soviet Union um, many years ago, and it's very different from everything you uh, you have read about collapse of Soviet Union or you, you have heard because I I want to write uh, a book that that would be not focused on Gorbachev and Yeltsin. It would be not focused on Moscow. Um, I've spent a lot of time traveling to former Soviet republics, uh, interviewed former first presidents or last first secretaries of the Communist Party or independence uh, movement's leaders. So it's uh, it would be a very uh, diverse picture from uh, from different angles, from uh, from the viewpoints from Kiev and Belize and Vilnius and. Um, and Almaty and Yerevan, um, and I think uh, it it would be very it would be very important right now because what we see right now is the bloody collapse of Soviet Union. We used to think that 
uh, Soviet Union collapsed peacefully in 1991. You used to thank uh, President Gorbachev for letting it go uh, in such peaceful manner. Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, it didn't happen that way. And what we have right now is the bloody collapse of uh, of, so of Soviet of Russian Soviet Empire. I hope it's it's the final collapse of uh, of that empire. But uh, another project that is inspired by uh, uh, by uh, my my book War and Punishment, uh, and I know that now it has to become my my new mission. And I I just if, even if I didn't want it, I had to do that. Um, I have to write something like a new history textbook. I have to create another non-imperial uh, narrative uh, of Russian history, not Moscow-centered uh, uh, people's history of Russia. I have to, I have to uh, um, give voice, give back voices to all uh, other ethnicities, uh, local tribes, uh, peoples uh, that were uh, colonized by by Russia during the last centuries, and um, we have to to include them um into that history as well i think it, it it's going to be very important for for the future generations of russia as well it's uh, it's going to be very important for the for any um people involved in in russian studies in uh in russian history um or who study R russian culture well mikhail thank you very much i appreciate your time i appreciate you doing this Michael, take it away. It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Joe. Mikhail, uh, thank you so much for this. Is there, uh, can people follow you on social media? How can they, how can they stay up with you and uh, the things you're doing from day to day, week to week? Absolutely. Uh, my, uh, what used to be called Twitter, and now it's called X, uh, is uh, Zigaro. It's like my surname with uh, letter O. In the end, that's a mixture of uh, Figaro and, uh, and and my surname. Um, for example, yeah, or or if you have um, any ideas, you can always write me on email. It's also very very um, easy. Mikhail, like my name, then dot, then Zigar is my surname, and at gmail.com. Oh, that's fantastic! Thanks. I'm sure after Thank this you. presentation, you will. Uh... Find yourself being followed. By thank you so people. much. Okay. I, I was and really honored to, today to be part of this. Oh, fantastic. Right. And thanks you, Joel, for, for being part and leading the discussion. Great conversation. We have learned much this evening, and we have a lot more to think about. So join us again for a future program, the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. Go to worldmichigan.org. And the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum, please pay Joel and his uh, colleagues visit. They've got a great exhibition right now called A Heartbeat Away, the American Vice Presidency. And uh, we, uh, we appreciate you being with us tonight. Good evening and peace on earth.